Have you ever wondered why Jesus took the time just a few hours from the time that he was going to uh, give us time to work on this a little bit. Uh, from the time that Jesus was going to down a cross, get that rumbling sound, see? God's telling you, hmm. Um, Jesus was going to down the cross, that he took the time to wash the disciples' feet. Did you ever wonder about that? This is critical moments. This is a critical time. I'll speak real loud, and we're going to get this down. And in the church, we talk a lot about sacrifice. And sometimes we talk about service. And those are difficult concepts to somehow weave together. We're going to try to do that today. Will you join me in prayer? Father, this morning we would not be here if you had not sent your son. We would not be here if someone somewhere had not served us. And in serving us, we saw the love of the Father. We pray today, Lord, that as we listen to your word from Scripture, as we invite you into our heart, as we unpack our ears, and you would allow us to meet you. To fall in love with you again. To desire to follow you. In Christ's name, amen. When I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, one of the things that happened to me is I felt like the something that was missing in my life, I had finally found. Anybody identify with that? Is it, there, it was just, there's a sense of peace. There was a sense of contentment. Was, there was a, a sense of, of being complete. There was walking out of that church building in, uh, uh, outside of Roanoke on 460 called Bonsack Baptist Church. Walking out of that church that day, there was a sense that even though all the circumstances around me remained exactly the same, I wasn't the same. That that missing part was found. My guess is that many of you in this room know what I'm talking about. And you can go back, and if we had small group breakout sessions for a couple of minutes, you could tell other people about that particular experience in your life. Others of you may not. You may still be looking for missing piece. But it wasn't long after that experience with the Lord that surprisingly another longing began to surface. And I think probably this is where most of us are as Christians as we become long in our faith from the time when we had that first experience with the Lord. That something else is missing. For me, I began to look for that other missing part not outside the church or in place of Jesus Christ, but going into the scriptures and trying to find out about the thing that Paul talked about, spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts seem to be a key. They seem to be inevitable if you're going to have a faithful and fruitful life in Jesus Christ. And I wanted to know if Paul has so much to say about them in Romans and in Corinthians, how, how do I find it? What is it? How do I employ it? Wanted to go in and discover spiritual gifts. They seemed intriguing. They seemed to be like a magic key. If I had that, then I would not only have this relationship with God, but I would have a reason for living. I would have victorious life. I could turn away the bad in my life. I could somehow... Uh, find a victorious faith and a joyous faith and it could be the key to me for doing quote in God what I couldn't do in myself in my own power however I began to become not long after disenchanted with spiritual gifts any of you been there disenchanted that these gifts 
seemed to be very confusing. There seemed to be no North Star. There seemed to be no common core around which people gathered relating to these gifts. Not only that, the church seemed to be divided over these gifts more than they were united by them. And then, perhaps the worst part, is that I began to see that whenever spiritual gifts came up, is this group over here that said they had them seemed to think they were more holy than this group over here that was still searching or didn't have them. And in that disenchantment, I got to a place where basically it was easy to shut my ears and eyes to spiritual gifts. And so a lot of my ministry was uh, just tipping my hat to a huge part of Scripture. And then along about the 90s, the frustration I had with this particular issue began to come to light when others across the nation were struggling in the same way, and they were much smarter and more blessed and more gifted than I. And they began to put some things together related to serving God in a faithful and fruitful way, uh, and they articulated it so others of us could grab a hold of the concepts. Isn't that neat? That's what's called having a spiritual mentor. And most of us have those people in our lives and, and we, you know, every now and then we say, I don't know about this and I can't figure this out and somebody else comes wrong and they say it and you say, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. You said what I said. And, and you finally get that sense that this is where it's going. They put a holistic approach together and for me it was like a light bulb coming on in the room. Because I began to see some things were going on in my life. And, and basically, what they began to say is this living a victorious life is having a relationship with God that takes into account that God made you. Do you know that? God made you. And when God made you, he made you unique and different from anybody else who has ever lived anywhere at any time. And if you have a problem with that, turn around, look your spouse in the eyes and say, see, I'm exactly like you. No way. And you wouldn't want it to be that way. We're all different. God has wired us or he has given you your makeup. And in all of the genes and things that you are, that's who you are. And you ought not to seek to be any different than who you are. That's how God made you. And then he put within us a driver. I've changed to using that word over the word I used to use and the word that they use because I do think it means more today. It, a driver is, is a passion. He's put within all of us who enter the kingdom a passion for something, a driver for something in our lives. And that particular driver is the place where we go and when we go to that particular place to do that particular thing or be that particular person, we are more fulfilled than at any other time in our life. That driver in our life. And then he equips us with spiritual gifts. And they're different. I used to think when you went over to Romans and you went into Corinthians and you looked at that list, that you just looked to write down the list and say, I want that one. And that's not the way it works. Is that somehow God equips us for what we need for the driver that we're involved in and the makeup that we have in our lives. And that trinity of understanding gave me a way to talk to people about serving others and about being in relationship with God. Those cluster of relational elements. And then a few years ago, uh, I discovered that there was one other. If I live long enough, I might discover another to go with that cluster. But it's kind of a fourth one that gets added into the cluster, and that's your season in life. And uh, I could have said something at the other worship service. Uh, we're going to talk about Moses, and he was old. And we're going to talk about him in a minute. But how many of you heard the news this week of a 16-year-old girl from India? And her season of life is to lead a worldwide effort. Usually 16-year-olds don't think like that. Any of you guys think like that? Preston, come on. You ought to be going for the 
Nobel Prize next year. Well, how about president in 30 years? No, no, okay. I think he just wants to fish. So, anyway, season of life is critical. Now, when you put all this together, you understand that uh, your makeup, I have seen many people change their makeup, change the way they're wired. But your drive often changes the spiritual gifts God gives you, and you certainly your season of life changes. And so God is a dynamic God working with you. You never get it complete. You keep on working on it. You keep on laying it out in your life. These are the tools we must have. And here's a key for those tools. Again, it's not a checklist. The key for those tools is you have that relationship with God. And it all starts with how much you love God. When uh, I've been in a little different situation sitting there listening to sermons as opposed to sharing sermons. And um, when service opportunities are presented by pastor or by church, I don't think I'm any different than you are. Usually when the pastor gets up here and he starts talking about that or a volunteer gets up there and they start talking about that, what I tend to see, and I think what you tend to see, what we tend to see, is a minefield of obstacles between what that person wants me to do and me doing that. There are a huge number of reasons I can't do that, won't do that, shouldn't do that, and a lot of other things that begin to go into place. Understanding your God relationship, understanding your makeup, is key to being able to deal with that minefield thing when you're challenged in your spiritual life so that you can move through where you are to soul satisfaction. Because I will tell you, until you're doing what God wants you to do, you're not going to be happy. There is a happiness factor in faith. There is a, a factor in faith where you're doing what you feel like God wants you to do. For the rest of the sermon, I'm going to talk about this as a journey. Because servanthood is really an opportunity to relate to God, relate to others in a life experience that moves you from this decade to the next decade to the next decade, always with the element of increasing your faith and allowing you to bear fruit. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Exodus 3 if you'd like to refer to the screen, you can go there. There's some admissions, so if you're following in the Bible, I shortened it down a little bit just to uh, make the reading a little bit quicker. But I want you to hear the Word of God this morning, uh, and I want this to come clear through us as we see Moses. Um, you could, if you're younger, and you're saying, well, Moses is old, this doesn't apply to me. You could make this Samuel, and I'm hoping that a lot of you younger guys, teenagers, remember the story of Samuel and Eli, and Samuel getting called to go to Eli, and God was saying, I have something for you, so put it in the context of a journey, whether you're an 80-year-old or whether you're a 12-year-old, put it in that context. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. We do not have a disconnected God. Listen to that again. I have seen the misery. I have heard the crying. I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the land 
of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But, don't you love but? Isn't that a great word? It means forget it, God. But, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? It's still the question today. Who am I? Who am I? If you're here today, and you're not into service of God, you just think worship is enough. You don't have a dynamic, victorious faith. You can't look at your faith and say, there's a faithful factor and there's a fruitful factor. God is doing something through me so that I'm a branch on Him and it's bearing some type of fruit. Then I challenge you to see this. A relationship with God mandates a partnership with God. A relationship with God mandates a partnership with God. God doesn't birth you. He doesn't baptize you in this tub over here and come up and you can go sit down. When I was at Bluefield College in my freshman year, we had a tent revival going on and some of the guys went to the tent revival and I didn't and I don't have mine so I have to fake it. They came back and they went down on a call to accept Jesus Christ and they had a card that let them get into heaven. And they had their get into heaven card and it was signed by the evangelist. So they made it. Folks, this is not something light we're talking about. There is an eternal life. There is a relationship, but there's also a partnership. Partnership with God. While salvation is praiseworthy, it is partnership that transforms your life. It's partnership that Terry was talking about when she said you walk out that door and you trust God for something. It's that transformation that occurs in that partnership. J.R.R. Tolkien, the writer of Christian fiction, challenges us uh, to see this partnership through the eyes of Bilbo Baggins. So if you're not a Christian fiction person, please don't tune me out for a minute. Hang in there for a second. If you are, get ready because The Hobbit's coming out in DVD. And you may want to go there. And uh, you may even want to read it one day. One day, Gandalf, who is the wizard or the wise man or the god figure, met this very satisfied hobbit. And hobbits lived in the little village of Bag Inn, and they were very satisfied. Life was good. In fact, the more I read that story, I think hobbits were Americans. <laughs> you know? Life is good. Life is good. And you might hear some more of that as we go through here. And so Gandalf says to Bilbo, I'm looking for someone to share in an adventure that I am arranging, and it's very difficult to find anyone. Kind of sounds like Jesus saying to the fishermen, come follow me, doesn't it? Have you ever wondered whether Jesus said that to anybody else, but they didn't go? You ever wonder if he went into the marketplace and said, hey, you guys that are making your money selling food, come follow me. And I'll let you sell the Lord's story to the world. And they didn't go. And they didn't go. Well, look, notice how Bilbo responds as if he speaks for us. I should think it would be hard in these parts. We are plain, quiet folks and have no use for adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things. Makes you late for dinner. I can't think what anyone sees in them. But after he plays with it for a little bit, with his, in his mind, he comes back to Gandalf and he says to him, You can promise I'll come back, right? And Gandalf says, No. And if you do, you will be changed. Like Moses and Bilbo, most of us don't want even a little bit of that, much less a lot of that in our lives. And yet at the same time, like Bilbo and like Moses who turned aside, you get 
thinking, with that God made you, there's something down inside. All my years of ministry, I've wondered why people go to church. Is it the preaching? Is it the fellowship? Is it the music? Is it because you have such a lovely environment? The fountains are flowing, the birds are singing, and the water is gurgling. Or is it because maybe today something is going to happen and I want to be a part of it. I want to see God do something today. I want to see it. And no matter how many times I have been disappointed, there is something within me that says, there's got to be more. And so we keep looking. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, in her poem, Aurora Lee, writes words that I first heard as a sophomore in college, as a freshman in college at Bluefield. And they still mean so much. She writes, Earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around and pluck blackberries and daub their natural faces unaware. Jeez. Isn't that right? How many times have you passed by a God moment? How many times have you ignored a God opportunity? Or is your love for God so great that you can see Him in others, in the circumstances of your life? And you can take your shoes off and you can drink in that moment. The journey in the partnership with God doesn't start with a checklist. It starts with your love for God. You have to understand, He loved you, yes. But you have to want to love Him. Do you really, truly love Him? That's why for me, Jesus Christ, no other religion does it, because Jesus Christ, His Son, came down, and He was able to bridge that tremendous chasm between what we think a God ought to be to where I discover what God really is. And in Jesus, this is the God I want. This is the God who is indeed there. And I can see through all of the Scripture how God's been working to get us to a Christ moment in our life. Without Jesus, we would never believe we were worth saving. And when I realize I'm worth it, I can love back. We could never imagine that God would come to us. He's up there. He's high. He's mighty. He made all this universe which every year scientists push out and push out for us and we see it's more and more fantastic. And yet here in the midst of all that little me, He came here. Without Jesus, we wouldn't understand that by Him, God living in our shoes. He understands our situations. The frailty of my life. He understands the temptations that I face. He understands me because He's been here. Without Jesus. Boy, trusting God would not be much of an option. I might fear Him, never love Him, but trust Him and be a partner with Him, I couldn't go there. Without Jesus, the words of forgiveness uttered from His bloodied body on the cross would mean nothing, just another lunatic. It doesn't do anything. But you put those words together with the resurrection of Jesus Christ and something powerful happens. Jane and I were at a restaurant the other day and I had never heard this and I'm throwing this in. It's not in the sermon, but it may be one of the things that sticks on you is that someone went to the restaurant at, uh, a restroom 
And so they left their napkin folded there, and the, the waiter came around to take the plate away, and we discovered a little etiquette. He said, if you're in a fine dining restaurant, and you're going to the restroom, and you fold your napkin, and you put it on the right, then they won't take your plate away because you're in the restaurant. But if you just take your napkin and you crumble it up and you lay there, they know you're not coming back. When Jesus Christ was resurrected and they went in a tomb, it says the cloth over his head was folded and in his place as if Jesus says, I'm coming back. Do you understand that? Can you love God on the basis of that? We, through Jesus Christ, we have hope for eternal life. It's not just a dream. And through Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit that gifts us so that we can live faithfully and fruitfully. God has so identified with us through Jesus Christ. And here's the miracle. He has so identified with us in Jesus Christ that we can identify with God. Jesus says, I no longer call you servants. Because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything I have learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and anointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love one another. We can identify with God because God has identified with us. We can become a partner with God. And what is God's partner? He says, I have heard their tears. I, I want that stopped. I have seen their suffering. I want that stopped. And I am sending you. I am sending you. And I am gifting you. And I built you that way. And I put drivers in you for that. And I have given you a season of life for that. So we begin to take seriously our role in the kingdom for others. Moses loved the people. He loved them so much that when God wanted to wipe them out one time, he said, God, I know your plan. I am partnered with you. You have made me part of that plan. And you said you were going to care for these people. And God did not kill the people. Now, it didn't mean those people didn't exasperate him to death. He raised his hands one time, and what happened? Ten commandments fell down and broke. Y'all don't remember that? That's supposed to be a joke. Got to be quicker than that. He was exasperated with them. You ever been exasperated with anybody? Okay. You been fed up with somebody? Okay. Did God ever tell you burn them? No. He said, Lord, oh, that's hard to do. Sometimes almost impossible to do. It's a hole in the heart to do. Then there's our friend Bilbo Baggins. Bilbo decided he was going to desert on the journey. Any of you ever left Christ? Just walked away. That's enough. I don't need to do this anymore. I'm finished. Most of us have, if not every one of us. You see, Bilbo had a home, and he realized that this service was taking him away from his home, and he wanted to go home. But he decides to come back, and there's a dwarf named Thorn Oakenshield. Now, I'm not calling everybody in your life that you don't get along with a dwarf, but we all got them. And so he wants to know, why are you coming back to serve? Why are you coming back to stay on this journey? And he presses Bilbo. Bilbo doesn't want to answer. And he presses Bilbo with this sentence, and I want it to just kind of plant in your head. Is that Thorin says to Bilbo, I need to know. It matters. I want to know why you came back. And Bilbo replied, I know you doubt me. I know you always have, and you're right. I often think of Bag Inn, his village. I miss my books. Anybody? I miss my armchair. Translation, lazy boy. I miss my garden. Cucumbers and tomatoes. That's why I came back. Because you don't have one. A home. It has been taken from you. But I will help you take it back 
if I can. Don't tell me I need to interpret that for you. When Thorne says it matters, he's speaking for every non-Christian who has ever been served by a Christian. And he is saying, why are you doing this for me? Why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? And the truth is, oftentimes, we'd rather be in an armchair. But the reality is, we love Jesus too much to stay there. A love for God must result in a love for others or it is no love at all. So when that love is poured out to God, the next thing you start to say is, God, how do I do this? Because you want to be trained, you want to be equipped, you want to be ready to serve the best you can. Martha Stiff puts an interesting twist on the burning bush when she says, we stand before a burning bush whenever other human beings share with us something of their relationship with God or something of the movement of their hearts. In such moments, we always realize we stand on holy ground. This is a movement of your heart. Speaking to someone who does not know the Lord about Christ is a movement of your heart. Forgiving someone who does not deserve it is a movement of your heart. And in the movement of the heart, there's a bit of holy ground in our life. And that's what God made us for. You cannot remain vibrant in worship and remain anemic in service to others. Now, I challenge you with a couple of truths and then some things to do. First of all, a truth. Pastors and churches can offer service opportunities, but we can't create servant hearts. God's in that business. We're not. We can say, this is a great thing to do. But there's no way we jump short your heart to be able to feed the poor. That's between you and God. And this one, Jim kind of gave me a look at the first service on this one. This is the truth. Service to others far exceeds what the church and the pastor can envision. Uh, I think sometimes the most humbling moments of my ministry was trying to get somebody to do a particular service and then finding out they were doing something far greater somewhere else. <laughs> when the word is preached and the heart is touched, ministry happens. But it doesn't always happen the way we would like to see it happen. But it happens. So it's not always about one church or one pastor or one ministry. But it is about how you are loving God by loving others. Here's a spiritual challenge for you. What are you going to do to deepen your love affair with God through Christ? What are you working on? I can't do that. If you're a young teenager... You know, some of you guys are coming to small group Wednesday nights, right? You're choosing to worship on your own Wednesday night. You're choosing to involve other Christians and, and a mentor, an adult mentor, in helping you figure out where you're going in this Christian life. What are you adults doing? Are you finding some place where you're asking those same types of questions? Secondly, how will you seek to be equipped to serve? One of my greatest frustrations, and I'm talking to some leaders of the church now, is that once we get in leadership roles in the church, we're about finished taking courses or being equipped. We know all we need to know. I had a deacon one time tell me that God told him everything he needed to know he didn't need to know anymore. Thankfully, it wasn't at this church. Your pastor, Jim, studies and studies and studies to equip himself. 
He should not have to do it that it is regurgitated. He should do it as an example that you should seek to be equipped. Where do you need to go? What do you need to do? To take those four relational points and magnify them so God can use you. And then finally, what are you doing to deepen, deepen your love affair with others? Uh, came pretty convicted this week with a lady who has a job. But she just doesn't make enough to get out of her car. She's sleeping in her car. Uh, needs abound. And my, one of the first thoughts you go when, when you come up to needs is you can't meet all the needs, therefore what? Right. Don't meet any of them. That's usually where we go. But in reality, God's going to put somebody in your heart. This is where that divine, dynamic relationship with God comes in. Who's on your heart? When I get pessimistic about society and the church, and I can and often do, I think of the people of Malachi's day. There hadn't been a word of God for years. And they said, it is meaningless to serve God. And God comes back to them in the third chapter, and this is what he says. You complain. You have said it is futile to serve God. Well, love makes a difference. And when we serve, if we do it out of love of our Father, you're going to see something happen. And later in that same chapter in Malachi, these are the words you see. And you will again see the distinction between righteousness and wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. A lot's been said about need for revival in our country. Revivals have always come during periods of time in history. Different things have happened. They've not all been about a preacher. We have had great awakenings in the United States. I think the next great awakening is going to be a great awakening of service. When the people of God, not any one man or any one church, but the people of God say, I love him so much, I want to partner with him. I will listen to the prayers of the lost and I will go to the needy. Join me in prayer. Father, we ask a blessing of blessings today. Not for ourselves, but we ask for the blessing that comes to disturb us, to put us on the street, to engage us where we are not engaged. The quote on my door that Terry was talking about comes from Bilbo Baggins. It is dangerous to walk out one's front door. We have spiritual houses. And we are very comfortable here. Could it be we need to move to a dangerous place? Walk out of the house? I know I can do it without a love for you. And I am praying that others can do it with a love for you. In Christ's name.